So I was going to put non-standard computation on the thing, but unconventional computing in academia, they're kind of the same thing. So I'll run you through what I'm going to talk about. I got involved in unconventional computing in about 2014. I went to a conference in Canada, so I'll give you some feel for what happens in that space. Uh, why it's interesting, this follows on from Al's talk, mainly. He's set me up really well for this. Uh, some ideas. So the idea, the main focus of this talk is we forget about bits. We forget about the representation that we're all super familiar with. And then I'll summarize a little bit about what I do, and then we'll see what the future is. OK. So I went to Canada in uh, 2014. Is it up or down? Down, that one. I went to Canada in 2014 uh, to an unconventional. Co I never know. I, I was like a, an amateur academic at the time. I was doing this is the hobby that turned into a business. This is the same thing. So I, d I, did, uh, I was doing some publishing for fun, which sounds a bit strange, and managed to get something in a conference in unconventional computing and went over to Canada to present it. It was interesting, the groups of people that I met. On the left-hand side, we had this thing called tiling. So these are all like, I mean, you might think of me being quite, most people think of me as a bit eccentric, but these guys were like, they were more eccentric than this group here, which says a lot, doesn't it? Um, so they were all kind of quite eccentric guys. There was the tiling group who did computation using shapes, so moving shapes around and self-forming shapes and algorithms that made shapes out of shapes, which just I didn't understand any of that. Then there was the chemical guys and the membrane guys. They did stuff with biological and chemical systems, uh, like computing over, like computing with uh, mold, slime mold, right? So slime mold has some computational properties. So there was a load of them guys. There was the spike guys, which Alan talked about last year, which are uh, to do with really how the brain works. And that guy said earlier, who was he? Yeah, that's really how the brain works. Well, they think. And then there's these, then there's these really interesting guys called the reservoir guys, right? So what they do is they're looking for entropy in the world, right? So they take a block of carbon nanotube. They connect some sensors to it. They'll connect sensors to anything. And, uh, and they somehow do computation on just carbon nanotubes, which is a great idea because carbon nanotubes don't take a lot of power. They are like super, super low powered. So like I came out of that conference saying to the carbon nanotube guys, you should commercialize what you're doing because, you know, there's a lot of money in, because they were doing classifiers. There's a lot of money in that. And then the, the most relevant guys were the memristor guys. Now, has everybody heard what a memristor is? Does everybody know what one is? Yeah, this is an educated audience. It's a bit of fool's gold. It's a bit of fool's gold, yeah. Yeah, so it's a memory resistor. It's a resistor with a bit of memory. And there was some things two weeks ago, seven-bit memristors in Southampton. So, so I was like, a bit confused by these guys, and they were a bit confused by me, to be honest. And I, I, I see computing as the Feynman way, just shut up and calculate. You know, we're really on about, like Al said, Number of, number, of, um, number of floating point operations, number of operations. So, so that's where it got to. Why is that interesting now? I think this is the next slide. Why is unconventionalness becoming commercial? Well, it's exactly what Al said. The, 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 there's this downward path of AGI or AI or whatever, or being able to process, do interesting things decision-wise. And then there's this real need upwards to provide hardware to support it. And it really is like ridiculously open space at the moment. Like Al said a lot about NVIDIA, but it's like they're not really rethinking this space. They're not really rethinking what they're doing. They're just doing what we've done traditionally very, very, very well and on a distributed level. And it just fits with the modeling. But if you look at this, this came out last week, OpenAI 5, which is the big reinforce. Does everybody know what reinf Does everybody know about OpenAI 5? Right, uh, OpenAI are the, like, the deep mind of America, and they're trying to democratize the whole AI space. And they do a lot with what's called reinforcement learning, which is kind of, I, I don't want to go into it, but it's like the bit that looks most like what we do, sort of thing. Like the sort of artificial general intelligence bit, rather than the stuff that Al said, which was um, computer vision, which is just like our eyes. The, the, the reinforcement learning is a bit more like how our brain might work. But I don't think it is. But anyway, that's an aside. But if you look at how much they've got this proximal policy optimization, 256 GPUs, 128,000 CPUs, 
right? That's a, lot of <laughs> that's a lot of computing power just to do this one problem. We worked out they're spending about half a million quid on electricity just to solve this one problem. So, like, you're faced with that and you think, oh, hang on a minute, that doesn't seem right. Like, fundamentally, when you look at the brain, and von Neumann published it, when he was into this, he published a paper saying, look, look the brain ones are, I think it was like 30 watts, or something like that. It was like a ridiculously small number of watts. So, so, so our, my take on it is, right, we're kind of wrong, right? We've done all this thing with computing till, like, 2018, and, like, it's, done, it's gone really well. Right? It's gone less, with less face facts. We can all do a lot with computing, but it's not, it's not maybe what we want to do. We have to, and again, Al's done this talk for me, we have to step back and go back a little bit and then come again. So this talk is really about that coming again. So we, we want to do a new bit. We're, we're not concerned with binary anymore. We're concerned with the low-level representation and changing the low-level representation. So here's where your audience participation joins in, right? I've got some questions. And I was going to buy, uh, who answered it first? I was going to buy them a pint, right? So, so there is, uh, you know, we're up for deals here. So this is the, and we mentioned it before, this is the von Neumann bits. This is classic, right? So everybody can answer that question, right? What is that number there? Name the number, 1001. Everybody know how to answer that one. Can I get an answer from the audience? No, no, I owe somebody a pint. It, it's D, right? So that's the way it's done. Why did we do it that way? Well, it's kind of efficient. Memory-wise, it's an efficient way. It scales as a log or as an exponent. So we could have said A if we were a sign bit, but it's, most people would say that. What's happening in unconventional computing is people are rethinking this. So here's some, the next, oh, nine, yeah. That's the answer. Here's the next thing. And this is really interesting. It's called stochastic computing. So we're computing in the range of probabilities. And quite a few people are doing that because a lot of machine learning is in the range of probabilities. So can anybody have a guess? I put a little, at the top is a little kind of cheat, right? So if you look at that top line with a 0 and a 1, can anybody guess what that number represents? D, very good. We're all on the ball. 0.75. So why is that interesting? Well, it's not really compressed. It's not really a compressed representation. But here's the trick. In multiplication, what we do is we permute those values. We permute the values, and then we line them up with an AND. So if you think about this bottom, this column here, it's lined up with an AND. If that's 0.5, that's 0.5. That is 0.25, yeah? So we permute the value with randomness. So it's kind of like using the probability in reverse to calculate the multiplication. So you get that idea that you can calculate multiplication very, very quickly, which, as we know, again, Al's absolutely laid this out for me, then, you know, multiplication is a big operation. It's a big operation in machine learning, a big operation in neural models. So we do that very quickly. The guy who invented that, I read his PhD, it's like... That's his idea in that PhD. He's done that, and he's now at Oculus Rift, the goggle guys, the VR guys. That's it, yeah. So why is this useful? It's multiplication and also probabilistic. And we live in a probabilistic world. When it comes to things like cars, there are going to be probabilistic decisions about whether we run down the baby or the guy on the other side that looks less fun. <laughs> is that right? That's not a really right thing, ethical thing to say. Okay, so this is one, again, I'll talk about. This is um, my take on quantum. Uh, that looks like a load of digits for those who are... Uh, uh, any answers? E. e is a great answer, and it is the right answer. You guys are super smart. So we need to know. This is the real trick. So the best way to understand quantum is to look at this SMBC comic and read this one thing. It means a complex linear combination of a zero and one state should think of it in a new ontological category. So we can't necessarily think about it in the way that we think about classical systems. And why is that useful? Well, we have this thing that they don't tell you about, which I call magic collapse, which is when you take an optimization problem, you collapse it down to its solution. Like, woof, just, it just collapses into its solution. It just finds the right solution. And that's like the magic collapse of quantum computing. 
And the algorithms are magic collapse algorithms. They take uh, a, a complex space and reduce it down into a classical space. And that's what they're going to do. I'm going to be like the IBM guy in 1960 and say there'll only ever be five of them. And I want to be proved wrong because I want everybody to have one on a phone. But I think there'll only be five. That's, yeah, but you remember that I said that and laugh at me in uh, five years' time when they're on your mobile phone. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Bill all the quantum you'll ever need, yeah, yeah. So I'm making that prediction. I, I don't know, it just seems such a, such a rarefied device. You know, you know, classical devices, not so rarefied, but quantum devices, you've got a rarefied atmosphere to kind of hold the, to hold the physics of how it works in place. So they're all really boring, those first three. Von Neumann is now boring. Stochastic was interesting two years ago, is now boring. Quantum, we all, we're nearly there with quantum, so we're all bored of that. Um, this is the interesting one, and it happens to be the one I'm involved in, curiously enough. Okay, so here's what I call a temporal bit. And what, you'll see why I call it a temporal bit. Has anybody got an answer for that? And again, there is a little cheat. It's not B. Bad guess. You have to buy me a pint now. <laughs> that's the way it works. That makes it easy. Oh, that's all right then. We'll buy each other a pint. It is, in fact, C. So what a temporal bit is, imagine, <coughs> imagine you've got a, a kind of click is a bit, right? And imagine I want to communicate eight to you. I want to communicate the number eight. So what I do is I click once, and that's that start bit there. And then what I do is I wait eight seconds, and then I click again. So we've got this kind of period. So if everybody knows, that's two clicks, click, click, so it's two bits, but I've actually communicated four bits of data because the time channel is orthogonal. So I've got eight, but I've sort of started, I've got it, I've got four bits, but I sort of started with two. Right, so that's really the way the brain does it. It uses this channel to do computation, right? So do this idea. So why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because it's compression, and the really interesting thing is, there's two other interesting things. I maybe go on to that slide, actually. There's, there's a few interesting things about this. One of them is you can do addition. Now, if I want to do addition, what I do is I say to you guys, let's do an addition, and I click once, and then I click again, and you miss that middle click, and then I click again. So what we do is three clicks. And the second number is the two to three, the first number is the one to two. And what we get is you just count the two end bits. So you do that computation with no hardware. You've done it because the channel the way it's represented is, is natural to the computation. And those clicks don't have to be anything, actually. I mean, I'm using my fingers. They can be electromagnetic signals. They can be anything that can oscillate, because that's really all a clock is. And the interesting thing is, you can have a clock that runs at a different speed to me, like that bottom line. And what you get is, you get this ability to do multiplication because you can start and stop clocks at a different rate. I communicate the number two and say, oh, actually run your clock twice as fast. And then what you do is go, oh, one, two, oh, that's four. So you're doing multiplication. You're doing addition and multiplication. And you're not having to do anything. To, you're not really having to do anything. You're not having to build a half adder. You're not having to do anything. So that's why I'm interested in temporal because it's this different way of representing. And actually, the paper that I published at the conference in Canada was this unconventional arithmetic, so this idea that that arithmetic was the way it works. So we published that, and the other idea I have is this idea of memory. So if I click and send it to you, you send it back to me, we've memorized that, right? So we have a circuit that's kind of memory, and if the brain does anything in terms of memory, that's probably what it does. It remembers temporal relationships between neurons. So you end up with that as a way of storing data. And the interesting thing about that is, well, you've got a way of storing data. It's the same channel that you're using to compute it. So, so you've got this idea of no bottleneck between memory and computation. It's all in that one channel. So that's what we, and you can make that eager. So what we said was, when you're doing that, if you've got an ad, if I keep sending you an ad, oh, you just do the ad when we're doing the memory. So you have this, this idea of eagerness. If anybody's ever written any Haskell then, or any programming that has this laziness concept, this is the idea of eagerness. So that was published. 
And actually, interestingly, that of all we've talked about, there are hybrids. And I'm interested in hybrids. So one of the problems with temporal is, if you've got the, million, num if you've got the number a million, I I've got to wait a long time to do the computation. So is there a hybrid way of using what binary represents things and also what this is, which is effectively unary codes? And is there a way of hybridizing those two? And that's what I've been working on. So, so this, this is the key, the key paper for me. John Hopfield, if anybody knows about neural models, John Hopfield has a model named after him called the Hopfield Network. And he said this. He said, if you try to divide a number by 7, if it's in base 10, it's really, really hard to do. But if it's in base 7, then it's like really, really easy to do because you know whether it's divisible or not. So what he's really saying is the representation allows you to do the computation much, much more efficiently. It, it's, it's sort of... It, it's not just a, a, an optimization; It's a rethink. So, so that was the paper I read that made me think, oh, maybe this is something interesting. So I tried to get him with like, his nose hanging over the bottom of the thing there. But. So domain-specific architects, where is this all going? So a AGI, we're all going to be in this... Um, artificial intelligent world where everything is calculated for us and we don't have to think ever again and, um, and, and we've got to build hardware for that and, and the ACM cheering guys are saying we've got to build domain specific hardware so hardware that's specific to a problem just as uh, NVIDIA are doing now and uh, they, they say uh, you can't see this very well but they say we're in a new golden age for, for architectures so, uh, so the opportunity both commercially and I have to mention open source. The opportunity open source is to build, there is an agenda, and FPJs play a part, uh, an agenda in, in, in building these systems. So, so we need to do that. So where am I in this? Well, I'm the, I'm the business behind tem the temple aspect of it. We got some funding for it. We got some government funding for it uh, uh, six months ago, and we're doing feasibility studies on building all kinds of systems based around this. The, the major thing we're interested in is multiply accumulates, which everybody's interested in. We've got an idea for a multiply accumulate unit using this. A multiply accumulate unit is the, like the workhorse of a neural model. It's the, it's the bit that's doing the kind of dot product bit that Al, like I say, set me up earlier for. So, so that's what we're doing. That's where it ends. There is this huge agenda to do interesting things with hardware. And I guess all you guys are uh, 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 hardware guys, and it's, it's worth thinking about. This, this is going to change. It's not going to be 7 nanometers, 3 nanometers. It's just not going to happen. We're going to get 3 nanometers. We're going to run out. We're not going to think of ways of doing anything more. The reason I put this up is all you guys here should go down the road, turn right at the cathedral, and there's a plaque for George Ball. His house was the guy there. So it's quite fitting that I'm talking about... Uh, Re reinventing binary when the guy that invented it, well, he didn't sort of invent it, but nearly enough, was just down the road. So that's me. That's my business. That's what I think. I don't really do social media. And uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? <laughs>